Hi, everyone. It's Leanne West, and I'm president of the International Children's Advisory Network. I just want to welcome you today to Ask the Experts with Anthony Chang. So today, I'd like to welcome and thank everybody for being here for Ask the Experts. Uh, this is an ICANN event that we hold monthly on the third Saturday of every month, and we are so grateful to be here. Our session is hosted by Dr. Anthony Chang, and we have a special guest today, Don Wolf. So we are so delighted to have you. Our session today will be on pediatric innovation. So kids, as you uh, think of questions and you want to share them, you can either unmute and have your questions asked directly, or you can write them in the chat. Either way, we'll monitor both. Um, and there's no question that's a bad question. Everything in this forum that we're gonna be talking about is open to ideas. So if you have ideas too, please feel free to share them. So thank you for being here. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Chang. Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's um, one of the best topics I can imagine talking about how we innovate to improve pediatric health. So um, I'll um, first introduce Don Wolf, who's been, uh, we've had the pleasure of closely working together uh, since a few years ago, and she became the president of the International Society of Pediatric Innovation, or ISPY which is entirely designed to convene, um, uh, get together everyone that is interested in pushing the agenda for innovation and in uh, improving children's health. So Don, welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Chang, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm delighted to be us, here. Yeah, tell us about what you do, because I, I think your role at um, Mercy is really pivotal in pushing uh, innovation in children. So tell us what you do there and we'll go from there. Yeah, so um, thank you. And I'm so delighted to be here and thank you for inviting me. Uh, so I do, I work at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. I have been with Children's Mercy for 16 years. Oh my gosh, <laughs> time has flown by. Um, I started our strategic planning um, department, which includes um, obviously the strategy of the hospital, what, you know, where we're going to build, what new programs, business planning, business development. And then probably, I would say maybe four years into me being there, one of the key pieces that we put in our first tr true comprehensive strategic plan for our institution was to develop innovation capabilities in the hospital. And so that led to the development of our Center for Pediatric Innovation, which has led uh, most recently to our team that's really focused on remote health um, and remote health services from an innovation standpoint. Um, I also am over our community health um, and community health initiatives, um, school-based health and international services, as well as the work we do with our referring providers out in the community. So. Um, a lot of different things that kind of fall or catch all in our department and um, lead an amazing, amazing team of uh, people. And it keeps me energized every day, especially when we've gone through this, you know, very challenging time of COVID, which I think has impacted all of our um, cultures and, and um, has put a burden on a lot of our care teams, as well as our own just teams that um, support our care teams. So maybe I'll get also... Um... Claire and Amy involved in the discussion because you're in the middle of this as well. Um, maybe we could just talk about, um, first of all, what is innovation? And then we'll talk about why innovation in children is particularly challenging. Um, how would you all define or uh, sort of clarify what innovation is and what innovation isn't? Maybe that's even more interesting. Uh, yeah. Don, we'll start with you, Don. <laughs> So for me, innovation, I mean, there is a lot of people want, you know, I think of research where research is, you know, testing out something, a theory, if, if it works or, or not, and you may have a creative idea. It's when that creative idea generates value for somebody, and then you can take and mon either monetize that value or just advance the work of your mission um, to, you know, take that creativity that's provided value to folks. I mean, I think that's the simplest way that I, I think about it is really just adding value to, you know, a problem or issue that you may be experiencing. 
um, or you may not even know that you're experiencing it, but really just creates new value for you. That's kind of a simplified way. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes uh, we all think we know what it is, but it's actually sometimes hard to talk about it and put it, it up. Amy, what do you think it is? And um... Yeah, I can jump in with that and just illustrate to Dawn's point that it's something that adds value. Um, so you guys know I'm a mom and I have two kids who live with type 1 diabetes. And we use the word innovation a lot in our household because we've seen things that have helped our lives and brought more value to the things that we want to be successful at, whether it's everyday life or it's even sleeping through a night, you know, without worrying about whether or not you're going to have a low blood sugar or really high blood sugar. Um, so innovation for us is deeply rooted in having technology that has advanced the support and care of our family's children so that they can go out and be successful in everyday life. So when we started and we were diagnosed just in 2006, um, not that long ago, I mean, that's still in this modern century, there wasn't the innovation available. It hadn't come to market and we weren't able to use the new tools that are out today. And there's been many, many advancements since we started this. Um, but I can also tell you there's many more to come because as far as we've gotten, what innovation does for at least me personally is it makes me excited and hungry for the next innovation to come along. Mm -hmm. We're always brainstorming ideas and thinking about ways that we can also help innovation. So it's not just something that someone does in a place all by themselves. Kids can be innovators, adults can be innovators that may not even be in the medical space. So I love that idea that everybody has something they can contribute. Yeah, I think anyone can be an innovator. It's just um, the desire to do that. Claire, what do you think? Yeah, so for me, when I think of innovation, I really think of bringing in kind of a creative perspective to things that you wouldn't necessarily bring a creative, ex like that you wouldn't traditionally think could be creative. So sometimes in more regimented like research or science fields, you don't feel like there can be a ton of creativity, but I feel like bringing that in and innovating and making different things and uh, making different products and bringing it to a new level that really brings, <clears throat> pardon me, innovation to the table. And I'd like to bring in a uh, Pujase had just uh, answered in the chat yeah. as well um, and said that I would think innovation is solving problems and using the resources you have creatively, which well, I, I think is one. a much better way of what I partially said. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. As um, you know, and Arlen Myers always says, and I think he's right on this about innovation, is don't just be a problem solver, be a problem seeker. Uh, we don't spend enough time um, so, sort of trying to, to define and clarify what a problem is, but we spend a lot of time thinking that we can solve problems. And perhaps if we do that, we're solving problems that are not really that universal, that important because we, we're thinking we're innovating, but I think I agree with him that innovation is just as much about problem seeking. Um, uh, Pujasai, do you want to, um, make comment on your excellent Excellent uh, comment about innovation. Do you want to unmute your mic and or uh, camera? Mike, about what I think innovation is? Yeah, we really liked your comment about innovation. It's such a wise comment from a young person. Do you want to um, talk about that a little bit more and what your idea of innovation is? Well, like I said in the chat, I think like innovation, it's basically solving your problems, mm -hmm. but using like, creative solutions for it, because kind of like shows what your personality is when you, you yeah. know, try to innovate something so you can do something you like, but also help others by doing something. I like the part that says using the resources you have because oftentimes we don't have enough resources. And you're right, innovation, I've seen some amazing innovation in third and fourth world countries that basically have put something together with just literally pennies worth of resources. So innovation is not only about, you know, sort of modern technology, it's also about making the best use of your resources. So I really like that you put that in as part of innovation. So 
And I also like to work creatively because um, you don't process improvement sometimes is lumped together with innovation. And that's not necessarily uh, using creative creativity to the max or, or um, uh, changing things dramatically. So there's, there's overlap for sure, but uh, really liked your answer. Mary Rose, not putting you on the spot or anything, but what do you think about innovation? What do you think it is and what do you think it is not? Any, any um, thoughts about that, Mary Rose? Um, basically what was already said, but it's almost like, I, I'm not really sure, like advancements mm -hmm. in technology, yeah. but you have it in a new way. It's like a new advancement in a completely different way that nobody else has tried. Yeah. Can you, um, sometimes when you can't define something, it might be good to mention something that you think of that is innovative or is innovation in, in, the, in our world. Um, what do you think is out there that's innovation? What, anyone? Especially our younger guests, what what is what something that you look at or think of when people talk about innovation? Anyone? We'll give the younger generation a first first attempt to answer that. I was just going to say one quick thing about um, projects that you might have done at school. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to. to um, protect an egg when you drop it. Think about what you did to create oh, yeah. <laughs> a safety net for an egg, or maybe you used a box of recyclable materials and you did something really interesting with that. You know, think back to your art classes. Innovation can also be found in classes that are art. And sometimes the best classes are the ones that allow you to have that without a lot of rules, right? Oh. So think about that when you're thinking about your response. Also, sometimes innovation is using what you have. You don't even need additional resources. And um, um, Don knows this, and I think I mean this too, I adopted two girls about six years ago now. And I was a total rookie dad. And um, I realized that when the girls were like seven months and two years, that when I bathed them, it was a struggle because they did not want to get into the tub. Even if I had just like an inch of water, they were just totally, totally, scared of being in the water <laughs> so i said well this is going to be a problem because i have to bathe them obviously so um and i went online of course first and see what smart moms have to say and i just you know it was hardly anything um a lot of them said you know uh, just have very, as little water as possible in the, in the bathtub and then i i noticed that the girls love playing in the laundry basket uh and um so I said, well, what if I married the two things and put them in the laundry basket and then put them in a bathtub with water? And then uh, I did that and it was like an amazing solution because it was, they, they actually thought it was fun to be in the laundry basket uh, and with the bath water. So, um, and a friend of mine says, well, that's a pretty good idea. You should make a business out of it. Like instead of just a laundry basket, you can create different things like an Easter basket or a pirate ship and, you know, and just make that a, a bath um, and basically a, a, con a container for kids. So um, someone said, well, that's innovation. You know, Spare Moses, who I used to work with, said that's innovation in a nutshell. That's innovation. You took something and you made something work without necessarily a lot of technology or a lot of cost. And it was a new idea because it was, I looked online, no one was really doing that. So, um, so I just always fondly remember that sometimes out of necessity, you innovate and you don't necessarily have to spend additional money for resources. So Dawn, you had a comment? No, I, I love that story. And Anthony, have you put that out in the market? Because I, like, I thought of my own girls, like they loved playing the laundry basket too. And I love the idea, but I, I, I think the thing that, and I, you know, I'd love to get people's thoughts on this, but I think that innovation is not an isolated thing. It's not from one person. It, it often takes a village and it's often a very collaborative process, even um, 
you know, people may come up with the idea, but it's the testing and iterating. It's, it's, you know, Spiro saying, Hey, Anthony, have you thought of this? Have, you know, I mean, it's, it, I, I think that people, you know, think of Steve Jobs, so like one innovator. I mean, he had a team of people. And so it's, you know, understanding, you know, I spy, I can. I mean, we're groups of people where it's all these minds coming together to say, is this the problem? And what are the different solutions we can come at? And I love the collaborativeness of innovation and the, the way that when you come together and put all these minds and how you can kind of take things and you pivot so much in innovation. Very, very rarely do you start out with your great idea and it hasn't changed at some point, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm curious if others feel differently, if they feel like it is more of a, um, you know, just one person kind of a, you know, one man show or one woman show, but yeah. I really Good have point. seen it just over the last couple of years, just how collaborative of a process it is. Yeah, no, that's a great point, Don. I think, I think most people think uh, someone like Steve Jobs is a lone innovator and he comes up with all the best ideas, but in fact, that's not true. He actually always says that, um, that it's a group effort from his team. Um, so um, um, Karen, you had some comments in the chat area. Uh, do you wanna elaborate on that? Which part? <laughs> Well, I'm, I mean, as somebody who calls herself a mission-driven innovator in her LinkedIn, I, you know, my whole world is wrapped around innovation. And I think over 20 years, I've been thinking about it at least because I, I didn't know I was innovating. I didn't know the word, you know, um, even though that's what I was doing. And probably my first um, experience with innovation was about building new programs. So a program innovation. And then part of my learning in Minneapolis, where I'm from, I learned about the ability to cross-pollinate worlds and the convergence that happens when you can bring different worlds together. Um, and, and then that brought me to Boston and moving into the, a world fit officially of you know, technology innovation. And that has like an add, add, uh, an add on. So I just think there are, you know, as I say in my uh, chat, it can be a product, a process, an approach. It's a way of thinking. Um, reverse innovation, what you were talking about in developing countries, um, can happen where they can invent something and then it, you know, gets mainstreamed into developing countries like the U.S. or Western markets. Um, that article that I um, listed is an interesting document uh, from the OECD, uh, Organizational Economic development, I think, out of Paris. It's, it's still from 2018, but from the technological standpoint, it's an interesting document to think about the breakdown of, of how you measure technology, technology data. So yeah. I'd like to see more of an innovation mindset be taught in schools from the ground up. What does that mean? It's about addressing issues and problems creatively, ultimately, whatever yeah. they may be. I think it's just a mindset. It's it's um, it's not a thing. It's not technology, which is the misconception out there. Right. It's just your how you think about. It. Um, so I see that Claire joined us. Hi, Claire. Good morning. Um, do you have uh, any of your personal ideas about innovation? And there's no wrong definition, by the way, because I've seen so many. Um, do you have any ideas about innovation and what it might be? Well, what do you think about when someone says innovation? Do you think about something that that you've bought or you know of that's innovative in a sense? We have two Claire's, but yeah, and I think this one is Mary Claire. Oh, Mary Claire, sorry. Yes. Mary yeah, Claire. Yeah. Any ideas about innovation or our other young guests? What do you is there a thing that you think about when, when people talk about innovation? I think something that comes up. Well, yeah, go ahead. I came up with uh, like an idea of what I think innovation can be, even just like in daily lives. Like yeah. my mom was asking me and my sister a question. Not sure what the question was, but she gave us two sides. And I like just completely ignored both sides. And I was like, let's go at it from this angle. Yeah. completely different from anything that that anybody was talking about and my mom was like oh right yeah you could totally do that 
it's like it's not right or wrong it could be like from the side or something like that no i like that um oftentimes i steal ideas or even things from other sectors in our society to solve a problem in healthcare um i'll give you a recent example that's kind of fun so our nurses came to me and said um we have like an innovation hour where people can just drop in and and now that with Zoom, you don't have to walk all over the place. So they said, well, you know, the IV tubing uh, in, uh, this is on the, in, the, um, in the hospital, they often bend and kind of get um, um, problematic because they bend and then they don't work. And it's at the, you know, the, the part that you can probably relate to, even if you haven't seen an IV, it's near the, it's at the connector and the, and the first part of that tubing, it literally bends. And then it eventually becomes a problem and not allowing fluid to go through. And then I thought, well, and they're trying to, um, you know, nurses are great at, the, I call them like um, uh, women MacGyvers because they, they come up constantly with workarounds to solve the problem. And oftentimes they'll solve the problem and not even mention it to the managers on the floor. So what they've done is they use tape and they use gauze and created like a protective like a little um, protective shield to prevent that bending at the at the junction between the IV tubing and the um, and the sort of the hub of the IV tubing. And they came to me and said, "Could there be an easier solution? Because we spent a lot of time <laughs> building building these protective shields so that the IV tubing doesn't bend." And it dawned on me that as they were talking, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking to them from home, and I'm. Um, I have a lot of computers and wires around and um, I have all these little, I don't know if you've seen these, these little sort of um, protectors um, that uh, while one of you talking, I'll try to grab one and show you. And you've, what you do is you put this thing around the, the hub and the, and the computer cord and it protects it from being worn down from all the bending. And I said, gee, I wonder if that fits the IV tubing. And sure enough, it was like a perfect fit. So I stole the something that's pennies to basically save the nurse's time and also for them to probably look for something that doesn't exist. So that was an easy tran transfer of something that's already in the computer world with, um, with, comp you know, with the wires from computers to put it into use in a hospital with IV tubing. And I think they're just basically using that now. So, and um, because kids use computers, so often these, these little hub protectors will have like little animals on them. So we can even get creative about, you know, the ones that we buy. So, and I, I see that often in innovation in industries is that if you think about similar problems in other, uh, other parts of, you know, of the society, then you can actually take those ideas and it's an innovative sort of adoption, I guess, in your own healthcare sector. So it um, doesn't always have to be something from scratch. Um, so no, th these are all great thoughts. Um, Anthony, um, not to backtrack, but Pujase brought up another really interesting perspective and had said, yeah. In innovation, it's a very collaborative process, but why sometimes only certain people are recognized in the process, like Steve Jobs had a team, but most uh, people only know of him and not the other team it's, members. Right, yeah. No, that's totally, totally um, a good point. Yeah, that we shouldn't, um, well, even Steve Jobs agreed that everyone in the room is always smarter than the smartest person in the room. <laughs> Although he often says he sometimes is the smartest person in the room, he had a lot of um, a lot of self pride, I guess. But um, I always think that no matter who you think you are, and even if you think you're the smartest person in the room, that you're just not as smart as everyone in the room thinking together. So I I personally will say that. So our team actually believes in it, and that makes everyone feel like they can make a contribution. You know, and I don't never count the youngest people out because even though they're shy. Sometimes they come up with the best ideas or the best perspective. So um, oftentimes we'll have a young person or a parent and or a parent in the room when we talk about innovation for something. Yeah, you know, and I want to just take this back because I think this conversation kind of dovetails into what we were talking about with leadership. 
So, you know, being a really good leader is recognizing the skill set of your team. And that's how you're also going to bring about some really great innovation. You know, if you say, well, I can do it all on my own. I can think this through all by myself. I don't need anyone. I have the best idea. That's really not a great leader either, is it? So mm -hmm. just kind of putting these parts together that we've been talking about all year, I think this is a great opportunity for everyone who is participating to really be a stronger leader and to be a stronger innovator and to surround yourself with people that can help in, in realizing your dreams. Anything is possible at any age, and we know that at ICANN, so we're always emphasizing that you guys are the experts. There's a lot of ways that you're thinking about things that we don't even begin to think about. So, you know, that's not a barrier either. We want to make sure we bring that to the forefront all the time. What I, what I like about young people is <clears throat> they don't, they're immune to failure. <laughs> they haven't, they haven't failed enough to feel that self-rejection. So it's, it's really good that they have no fear. It's no different than um, I, I took my nieces out surfing one time and I was beginning to learn surfing myself. Within a few hours in an afternoon, they were much better surfers than I was because they weren't afraid to fall into the water. Um, and um, it just reminds me, and skiers are the same, right? You've seen kids learn skiing in a few hours and they're just totally um, lacking fear that adults are, are used to, and then and that slows us down, you know? So I think that that um, willingness to try anything and not be afraid to fail is something that we lose as we get older. And that really slows down innovation. I love what Don wrote about fail. <laughs> I'm gonna steal that from you. Um, and that's another thing about innovating is steal, you know, with people's permission, steal ideas and steal things. Um, because that's that saves a lot of um, you know extra effort on your part to do something for, from scratch. Um, no fail. Some people call that a mashup, Dr. King. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think the for our younger generation guests, um, one one um, sort of um, element of this is that doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, administrators. Uh, don't like the word failure, and they are very, very hesitant to try something that might lead to failure. And I think that's a mindset that's very um, counter to the innovation mindset, because innovation mindset, they say, you know, fail quickly so that you can pivot and change and, and um, go into something that's better. And um, I think, um, you know, it's often said that Thomas Edison failed, you know, 10, literally like 10,000 times with the, with the light bulb. And he said he didn't fail, you know, 10,000 times. It was just, those were like 10,000 steps to get to the final success. So I think similar to what Don said, it, these are just steps. Think of these as steps to get to the final success. So um, then you have a different way of looking at innovation you're not really you didn't really fail at something you just need to get there in mul multiple steps so no amazing uh discussion and thoughts i like it uh from everyone do you do you think um uh can you say something that's not innovation because that's a tougher question perhaps what is something that we do and we see that you can say Okay, that changes things, but it's not really innovation. Is there such a thing as something that's not innovation? Is research innovation? Because I get asked this a lot. Is research innovation? Or if you can flip the question around too, is innovation research or a kind of research? Any thoughts? Don, you probably get asked this also. Yeah, so <clears throat> you know the the research one is 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 a challenge. I feel like research at the research stage is is not necessarily innovation. I think it's when you actually take it and then <clears throat> move it down the the value chain, and you're able to execute on it where it really impacts people. Then then it becomes innovation. But when it's when it's simply a a publication. <laughs> Or, you know, getting new ideas until you take that new idea and it goes back to like translating it into value. 
Um, but I don't know if everyone agrees with that. It, it, it research becomes innovation, but research in itself is not innovation is, is how I look at it. But yeah. I know there's disagreement in this. And, and I know, you know, Anthony, you and I, we've had discussions at some of our iSpy forums about this and, um, and uh, it's, it, it can generate um, strong opinions. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes I don't understand the emotional content that go into these discussions. <laughs> these are like just your, your personal feelings about yeah. them. Um, my, again, my friend Spiro said it really succinctly. He said, research is taking money and turning into knowledge and innovation is turning knowledge into money or value. <laughs> so yeah, it's, I love it's it. Simple, That's perfect. But pretty uh, useful differentiation if you want the differentiation. Um, we uh, at our hospital, we're actually converging with um, research. So innovation and research are converging. Um, and uh, so we actually think that we can blur the boundary to, to each side's benefit because yep. uh, research definitely needs some innovation. <laughs> it's a very traditional- And, and innovation uh, needs research, right? I mean, they, they are like, you, you need that yeah. much, but it's, so but they aren't like, the same. <laughs> we feel like it's like, um, should be intertwined more so we're actually converging uh, MI3 or the Institute that f fosters innovation. We're actually joining forces with the Research Institute. Um, and uh, because we think it's both sides can benefit. Both sides want to help kids, you know? So there's some really big common areas. We wanna help kids. We wanna use resources to help kids. So there's so much over overlap in terms of our desire to do things that we can perhaps learn a lot from each other. Um, I asked, I like the question that Amy is, poses, is posing, um, what's your favorite innovation and why you love it? So um, we'll start with our younger guests. Mary, Claire, um, what is your favorite innovation and why you love it? Are you there, Mary, Claire? How about uh, Puja Sai or Mary Rose? What is your favorite innovation? Um, I don't really have a favorite innovation, but every innovation I've been introduced to, I'm more like grateful for it because, no. you know, it's just made life more easier for like me and even like the society as a whole. Mary Rose, any? Do you have a favorite? I think like the internet is a great innovation because um, it helps everybody be able to connect more easily. So somebody could learn something halfway around the world and you would learn about it in like a few minutes from the internet before it would take weeks or months before you ever even knew. Like even wars, some people didn't even know that the war was going on until like a year later. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're right. That is actually a great example of innovation. Um, when it first started, I don't know how much you have learned or know about the history of the internet, but when it started, no one thought it was gonna work and no one thought this was a good idea even. Um, so. It's amazing that we, we, we rely on it so much now. Um, how about um, Mary Rose, did you wanna uh, chime in and, and tell us about your favorite innovation or Mary Claire? We'll, we'll always go to the, our younger generation guests before we go to the grownups. Okay, maybe you can think of it, think of something and then come back later. Karen, uh, you mentioned something that I think you said it's your favorite innovation. Well, it's not my favorite, but um, it's just, um, I, it made me think about innovation. When I used to swim a lot at the gym, um, there was this machine that took water out of a bathing suit. And I always thought, and I started talking about innovation with people, this is my gym mates in the locker room because you know you everyday objects you think about how they're innovate you know how they're innovated how they're created um, so I just think what, looking around 
your environment. There's so many things you could think about around what, what someone, the toothpick, who thought about the toothpick for God's sake? Or, you know, the post-it note that just came from my home state of Minnesota, 3M, that was an accident. Um, you know, so it's just all interesting to me. Yeah, and that's a good point that innovation sometimes comes from uh, an accident or a mistake or something that was thought to be a failure. And then people realize that you can turn that thing around and think about it as an innovation. So um, Reese's peanut butter cup. So there used to be a, there wasn't a commercial, I think that I think if I remember that, you know, it happened because by accident, these two flavors came together. <laughs> Food um, innovation is a really interesting topic to me. Uh, Claire, do you have a favorite innovation? I don't know. I, I feel like my first thing that I think of honestly is like a vacuum. Yeah. <laughs> I just feel like, you know, things like carpet, it wouldn't be so easy to clean. I know a broom covers hardwood floors, but for me, carpet, I, a rake maybe, but yeah. I feel like the vacuum is pretty yeah. innovative. Yeah. Yeah. Especially it's since definitely. it combines cleaning and you've got the technology side and how it was yeah. built and the whole ideas behind it. It's pretty neat. I know that sounds not so neat, but. No, it is absolutely an innovation. Amy, do you have a favorite one yourself? I do. I actually have a couple, but the one that I love the most, and I alluded to it earlier when we first started talking, is the care that has transformed my daughter's lives. And one of the innovations is a continuous glucose monitor. Yeah. And when we started this journey, it was just percolating and just coming to fruition. And there was not a great way to wear one or use one. And in fact, how this, op this apparatus works is that you would have a site injected into your body with a little wire sensor. And when we first started, that had a cord that fed it to a black box, kind of like what you would see if there was an airplane or, or some place where data was being stored. And what happened with that was you would collect this data for a period of time, probably one or two weeks, and then you would send the data off and you would wait two weeks for it to come back. In the world of diabetes, that innovation was the beginning, but it really wasn't useful and it really didn't do anything because two weeks worth of data from two weeks ago was irrelevant by the time you got it back. So over time that became wireless. So the innovation kept getting better and better and better. And now the sensor that the girls wear is this little tiny sensor and while I would like to say it's pain-free, it's not entirely, there's still an injection, but the data is simultaneous. So as soon as you put it in, it starts to read and you can see what your blood is doing, if it's going higher or lower, and anybody could utilize this technology, but it's really for people who need to monitor that closely. And once they have that data, they can make real-time changes in their care and adjust their own medicines in a rapid manner so they really reduce the risk of having those lows and highs. It's not perfect, but that just gives me such great hope that in the span of what, I don't know, 14 years, we are so much closer to having something so much better and it's just gonna keep getting better and keep getting better. And there's new innovations coming on the horizon, but hands down in this world, that is my favorite, favorite one. The other mm -hmm. one is silicone because it's everywhere. And it has so many multi-purposes and purposes we haven't even thought of yet. You can use it for baking and protecting yourself from hot things. And you can use it in vehicles and you can use it in, in all kinds of products that we use every day. And that's an amazing innovation to me. I think Teflon is another one that I can Yes, think. Teflon too, yes. Not having to screw up <laughs> pots and pans. Yeah. Um, um, and I think, um, no, those are great examples. And sometimes you have innovation on top of innovation. So right now the innovation on top of continuous uh, glucose monitors is adding a layer of artificial intelligence so that it's really going to be fully automated. So sometimes innovation is in steps towards something that's finally the best ever. Um, Claire, can you, um, what's your favorite innovation? I'm sorry, did we ask you already? Me? Yes, mine was the vacuum. Yeah, yeah. If that's it's right, Mary that's right. Claire. Don, I think I skipped Don. Don? Oh my gosh, I have so many things. I mean, it's hard to 
it's hard to come up with one single thing. I can tell you that there's an innovation that I hope will come. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of, you know, thinking of what Amy talked about uh, continuous glucose monitoring, I, it made me think of being a celiac and hoping for an innovation that someday I can once again eat a butter croissant because I love those and no one can make them that um, out of gluten-free, you just can't find a really good no. butter croissant that um, doesn't have gluten in it. And so I, I always think of, you know, when I see new drugs come on, even the most recent, um, you know, the, the mRNA um, COVID vaccine and what maybe that could do if you get a vaccine for things like having celiac and for having that, you know, um, trigger that I have in my system that makes me have an autoimmune response. Is there a vaccine that can be given that, you know, basically tracks that back? And so those are things that I think about. The other thing I'd be interested in, in knowing, because there's so many things that we talk about, like the internet is wonderful for so many things, but there's also negativity that comes with, to it. And, you know, the, the things that, um, misinformation that's put against, you know, that comes out in the, in the internet. I, I often think of things that like, um, what isn't a good innovation? Nuclear bombs. I mean, think about things that, but nuclear energy for a nuclear plant. I mean, there's kind of this, even silicone, which I love that one, Amy, that's so great. Um, but is it harmful to the environment? So thinking about those things and how, you know, great innovation can also have you know, negative yeah. and, and we're often balancing that in healthcare because there's advancements we can make, but what, what are the ethical Im implications of some of those things that we innovate around that may be really wonderful for so many other aspects, but on the flip side have so many negative things. I'd love to hear some of the kids, you know, what their thoughts are and things that are both positive, but also have a negative side too. I think drones is another example that we're seeing. While it can deliver vaccines to parts of the world that can't have access and because of transportation or being in the mountains that, that I've seen um, is also used to um, deliver bombs. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. um, and one of my, my tech friends said, well, you know, um, they'll deliver bombs, but with facial recognition software now that you can build into the drones, they can avoid civilians. I said, well, that doesn't really make it better. <laughs> so he, his thought was, well, that's going to be better because we can actually just kill soldiers. You know, so like, well, that's like perhaps lessen the evil, but it doesn't really make it a acceptable technology, you know, in general. So people have different perspectives. Um, one of my favorite innovations and in, in, uh, illustrates the principle of convergence of different technologies is Uber. Um, Uber really is based on no, not new technology, but pulling together two or three different innovations or different technologies. And I love that example. Um, I think another example is um, uh, SpaceX, I think. Um, that illustrates boldness in innovation. And, you know, um, if you haven't seen it, I really like to recommend the, um, the documentary called Return to Space that just came out last week. Um, it, it's been criticized as like a basically a SpaceX commercial, but I, I didn't see it that way. I just thought it was telling the story of SpaceX. And why should we not tell the story of SpaceX? It's such an amazing, um, um, company. And um, it tells how Elon Musk almost went bankrupt a few times trying to support SpaceX. And the concept was trying to get us back into space, get us to Mars, but also use the rocket uh, in such a way that it re becomes reusable. You know, as you know, it's, it's close to $500 million to design and put together the Saturn rocket that launched Apollo program, 500 million each. So that's 500 million lost every time that we launch a rocket. And that's a 1970s dollars, which is even more amazing. Um, so Elon Musk always thought that um, that wouldn't be nice to have the rocket come back to the, to the landing area so that you can use it the next time. And people thought it was like insane. They thought it was science fiction that he's finally, finally totally lost it. And 
to make matters even worse, and you'll see this scene in the documentary, his, his boyhood hero was Neil Armstrong, as I was, you know, when, when he landed on the moon. And even Neil Armstrong came in and said that was, that was um, basically stupid, that was, didn't make any sense. It was um, because the government was thinking about partnering with SpaceX, NASA was. And he actually, Neil Armstrong even came in and basically wanted that whole discussion to shut down. Can you imagine your boyhood hero telling you something is crazy and you shouldn't do it? And that really, um, and Elon Musk got very emotional talking about like, it's like your boyhood hero shutting you down has got to be one of the worst feelings you can imagine. But guess what? He was able to do it and do it in multiple ways, landing two rockets at the same time even. And they just, you know, six, they were successful in sending civilians so essentially in a fully automated rocket and going to the space station or going to orbit. And um, I admire him for that kind of bravery, even um, despite your boyhood hero telling you that you're wrong and you shouldn't do something. So um, that's what innovators do. You will persevere and persist no matter what, if you believe in your idea, but you have to balance that with, with you know, escalating your idea when it really isn't working. <laughs> so if there's still a chance that it will work, I would persevere, but you have to know when to stop also. All right, um, see a lot of comments here. Mary Rose, do you wanna talk about- I love that one wrote? that she just put. Oh, um, Mary Rose, do you wanna just talk about what you have put in the chat area that when you're younger, I, I love that. About innovation when you're um, younger. Well, I think that when you're younger, even if you have school, you have a lot of free time. You have all of your friends talking about these new innovations and you really just more easily learn because your brain hasn't fully developed. So it's developing all of these new technologies really easily. But as you get older, it's just harder because you have jobs, you might have kids, you don't have enough time to really um, learn about these new technologies so you might hear about them but you never give them much thought so yeah. if they really if everybody's using it and then you look back and you're like wait i don't even know what this is yeah. and it's just could be harder because you're like everybody knows what this is on the other hand being younger as i mentioned earlier you have a certain freedom that adults give up when they <laughs> become a grown up. Um, that sort of uh, creative mind. And I think that's why I like about Elon Musk also, he has a younger mind when he innovates. Like, I think probably a kid can imagine a rocket coming back like a, like a slingshot or a boomerang, right? But it took a young person's perspective to come up with that idea. And, and um, it's, it, it reminds me of my, <laughs> Sometimes my kids are, when they really drive me crazy, I say, stop acting like kids, which just sounds ridiculous. And then they've come back with a line, stop acting like an, a grown up, you know? <laughs> like, so, so innovation is kind of like that. We have to stop innovating like we're grown ups. We have to start innovating like kids and vice versa sometimes. Um, Karen? Karen, did you have a comment? Hi, yeah. and sorry for the background noise. Uh, my my headphones or my jack is not working, so that's something I have to do after I get off the, this call. But um, something that I was tying back to what Amy was talking about around leadership, what we were talking about a, a couple of times back or maybe even last time, and that is sometimes when you're leading, people are not always going to agree with you or understand, et cetera. And it's the same thing with an innovation or the way you think in an innovative way. But if you have such a rigid mindset or people are used to things in a particular paradigm, they might poo-poo your idea. They might poo-poo what you're thinking. And sometimes you have to listen. Um, and Benet Brown talks a lot about this. Uh, if you know any, anybody knows Benet Brown's work as a sociologist about creativity um, and who you kind of invite to your table, so to speak. Um, or who you invite to the audience. But I think that it's a tricky process for one to figure out when to pivot, when to let go, and when to carry on, because that's also what an innovation can be sometimes, as they say, misunderstood, 
ignored, misunderstood, and then maybe eventually accepted. Um, I don't think there's a formula for that, but I think it's around leadership. Sometimes people are going to disagree with you. They are going to think what you're doing is nuts. And you have to listen deeply within yourself about how to carry on or not. Um, and I know I have experienced this in my own life and it takes a resilient and endurance and strength to carry on. And you might be wrong, you might be right, but um, it's not for those necessarily to decide for you necessarily. So one of our, on and on and on, but. Thank you, Karen. One of them, um, and Dom definitely remembers um, Owen Aurelio from Stanford. And one of the things I always remember about Owen is he has a perspective that is very wise. And you may remember this, um, Don, when he handed a rock around that and, and asked us to say something after we read the message on the rock. And the rock said, uh, imagine that you cannot fail. Uh, do you remember that, Don? Were you there that time at the Stanford campus? I was not, but Krista was. And I remember that was really impactful yeah. for her because she came so back he, and shared that. That's right. He asked us to say something or imagine a project or a solution to a problem. And after we read that message, so I think innovation is also good if you just imagine that you cannot fail, I'm sure Elon Musk thought that. What if I cannot fail? I'm going to have these rockets come back so that this is a sustainable operation. And I'm sure he had even engineers tell him this is so silly. And even for Elon Musk, it, it was too silly. But he said, you know, if we just imagine we, we, we cannot fail, we'll get it done, you know? Um, so in fact, he got it done. So I, I think that um, the hardest thing for healthcare workers is to change the mindset that failure or lack of success, sometimes lack of success, success sounds a little nicer than failure. The lack of success is totally what you, what you need to get somewhere to, that you eventually want to get to. Yeah. Um, so in the closing few minutes, Maybe um, we can just spend a minute or so talking about what are additional challenges that we have with innovation in children for children's health. Um, again, we'll start with um, our younger generation. Any comments from our younger guests? In my case, everyone is a younger guest, but <laughs> our youngest guests, how's that? <laughs> Any thoughts about what are additional challenges with, with kids and health with kids? I, don't know. I think we have one in the chat here. Uh, Mary uh, Claire just said, well, I wanted to make bracelets for a children's hospital because I enjoy it and it's relaxing. So now I'm making <clears throat> bracelets for a Tennessee hospital. So that might be in a wow. That's awesome. It's like a, um, a kid to kid thing. That would be amazing. That that personal touch and element is, I think, an innovation in a way. Um, you bring extra value to something because everything's manufactured. But if you could make it, sounds like you want to make it a personal, person-to-person -person thing, especially in this stage, this day and age of everything becoming less personal. That personal, I think, aspect is so great. Yeah, I, I love that idea, Mary. Claire. I love she, it. Should do I it for it. for um. You can bring it to iSpy and I can, and we can help you popularize that concept. And Mary Claire, just so you know that that's one of the things that kids feel most isolated from is seeing their friends. So you're bringing friendship, not only the bracelets, but your actual friendship when you send those. So that is wonderful. I think it's important thing that sometimes. It's not necessarily innovating the process, the, pro the, the product, the product may already exist. It's then how you deliver it or how that you yeah. take something that already exists and, and have a new delivery mechanism. And so, you know, I certainly at our children, there's nobody making bracelets. And so it's innovative from a standpoint of what you're doing and what you're bringing to the hospital. So that's great. Well, Anthony, I, I will yeah. speak to the piece. I'm, I'm, I'm not one of the younger kids, but it may prompt them to get, you know, what they've experienced 
in hospitals, you know, the challenge in innovating in hospitals is that we're dealing with life and death. And so we are very risk averse environments. And to bring any new ideas or concepts, it, it, it scares everybody because they were so process-based. And so this is how you do things. And to push people to think outside the box um, has been something that we've worked on really the beginning of our strategy around was really to create a culture. And I feel like we finally are there that I can bring kind of crazy ideas <laughs> or others. We can help promote other people's ideas that before people would have just completely shut us down. They're now willing to finally listen and be like, you know what, we've seen the results of some of this value that you've brought. And we're, there is more of a risk um, tolerant uh, acceptance, but it's still something that we struggle with. And, and, and I get it, right? You get it because we're dealing with people's lives and we have to be careful about what we do. And, and it's making sure that you put the protocols in place, but it's also just you know, allowing people to iterate and think differently and um, recognize that what we're trying to do is actually positively impact the health and well-being of kids. Um, sometimes, yeah, sometimes with this discussion came up uh, at one of our recent meetings, and I always turn to turn that perspective around 180. And because I get asked about AI a lot, you know, is it ethical to use AI? And I'll turn that around and say, well, I'll challenge you with the notion that maybe you th we need to think about, is it ethical not to use AI? And I think we could sometimes also say, is it ethical or is it acceptable that we don't innovate you know, in this area? And all of a sudden the room changes that you feel like the, the tone and the postures are different because people are realizing, wait a minute, I think he's right. If we don't take a risk here, that's not ethical either, right? If they're afraid of failing and putting kids' lives at stake, guess what? Like kids' lives are lost because we're not innovating in certain areas. So I will be the temper radical in the group and say, well, okay, so this, this drug or this therapy may be high risk for kids with this rare disease, but guess what? This rare, this, um, kids with this rare disease are all dying before the age 10. So I think it's not ethical not to pursue anything, you know? So it's amazing how fast people's mindset can actually turn around and all of a sudden you lower the barrier <laughs> to, to getting these things pushed across. Uh, Amy? Yeah, you know, this Good is- question. Right? Oh, sorry. So the, oh, sorry, Karen. The weight of the kid's voice on this group carries a lot. So those discussions that Don and maybe Dr. Chang are having in their hospitals, having a youth advisor yeah. such as yourselves to really share the impact of those new treatments and that new technology yeah. and needs for process improvements in your hospitals or your clinics, that's so important. And that's why we do everything we do at ICANN. You know, we're the advisory network for kids. So we're out here sharing your experiences. And when you're in the next appointment and you see things that you're like, oh, we can make this better. You know, we could make this something that's really great then by all means share because that's we have the group of experts that can help take it back to their hospitals and we can do stuff to make it better for not just yourselves but for all kids to come no, i agree I, I think you know bringing your point and dawn's point together i think it's not acceptable that we settle into you know a sanctuary and feel like we're totally safe we need to wander out and just like Elon Musk says in the documentary, I don't want to say too many lines on that documentary, but you know, forever we've looked at earth as our cradle and uh, it is time to leave the cradle. Just like, I think we can look at pediatric innovation that like we've been safe for a long time, maybe too long. And I argue that it's time to leave the cradle. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to jump onto my next call, but I so enjoyed um, the session with all of you. Amy, thank you for the opportunity. I didn't know I was leading a discussion, but I, I, I really enjoy talking to everyone and especially our younger generation. So um, uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you all. I appreciate it and have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy some sunshine. We'll see you in about a month. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. So,